a, a number of y'all have commented, well, Pastor, we've seen you driving this week. Well, yes, I wasn't supposed to start until this Monday, but my own physician said, well, you can drive around Navasota. So I've driven around Navasota for a week, and I, I tell you, it, it feels like I, I'm out of jail. You know, when you're stuck in that house, those walls get in closer, and every time you want to go somewhere, you got to call somebody. Thankful to the church family, I've uh, eaten very well. Thank y'all. Bring you my lunch by. I just couldn't make it without that. But now I've got wheels, so I'm I'm okay. I can, <laughs> believe me, I can track something down. Um, so this Monday I can drive wherever I want, but only an hour and a half at a time, and I probably won't drive any farther than an hour anyway. Build up to it and get my strength. Remember the 27th, the last Sunday of this month, that's in two Sundays, I'll be back preaching, so I'm looking forward to that. In the beginning of daylight savings time, I want to see more of y'all on Wednesday night because it's now light after, where you can get home before the study ends. I'm looking forward to certain people returning. And it was because it was just dark. They couldn't see to drive at night. That'll be nice. And today, uh, Kevin Walton is back again. We're very honored to have him give us a wonderful message. Thank you. Well, good morning once again. It is a pleasure to be with you. And it is a nice day. Even though we lost an hour of sleep. We'll be all right. And it's good to be able to see Pastor Max back up here again and getting stronger every day. There have been lots of good words that have been shared with him, I'm sure, over the last several months as he's been getting well. You know, words have a lot of power, don't they? How many of you have heard or quoted the old adage, sticks and stones may break my bones, but what? Words will never hurt me. Well, that's right. That might sound good. But the truth is, words have power. Words can help heal, but they can also hurt and destroy. And over the years, psychologists have studied words and found that they have a profound effect on the human brain. Words can either build up someone's spirit or tear them down. Words can either encourage or discourage. There's really no middle ground. Research has also proven that our brains function at their best when we're processing positive rather than negative words. And the Bible echoes these statements as well in the paraphrase of Proverbs 15, 4, which says, kind words bring life, but cruel words crush your spirit. When you read about the lives of great men and women in history, and I really like history. Some of the people that I read about in our Revolutionary War and our Civil Wars and many, many other things that have gone on through, through the centuries are just fun for me to understand. And now that I've moved to Texas, I've got a whole new state to learn about. I agree. There you go. But with those individuals of success you will often find that there's some person or group who encouraged them. And that encouragement was a key factor in all that they achieved. And the Bible is filled with stories about people who encouraged others. One of the oldest stories in the Bible is a man whose name was Job. And he certainly had some problems, didn't he? His animals had been stolen, his servants had been murdered. 
His home had been destroyed and even his children had been killed. And to make matters even worse, Job's own body began to break out with boils. And who came to encourage Job? His three friends. One of the key things a friend can do is to encourage you when you're down. To encourage you when you're healing from heart surgery. To encourage us from a lot of things that we might experience in our life. It's always great to have somebody stop by the house or give you a call or just put their hand on your shoulder and say, you're special. I care about you. Doesn't that make you feel good? It really does. We find another story in the Old Testament about David and King Saul's son, Jonathan. They were the best of friends. Even though Jonathan's father tried to kill David, Jonathan loved David and often warned him about his father's plans. And Jonathan encouraged David when he was down. And this morning, I'd like to look at another man, another encourager, whose name was Joseph. Now, you might be thinking this Joseph is the guy back in Genesis, the coat of many colors. Remember him? It's a different one. And it's not the father of Jesus. But this man was a key leader in the early church in Jerusalem. He was a Jew from the tribe of Levi. Actually, he's the only Levite mentioned by name in the New Testament. Joseph was raised on the island of Cyprus. His family had considerable wealth and social status. And Joseph became a follower of Jesus Christ sometime around Pentecost in Jerusalem. He was related to a woman named Mary who opened her home for many of the believers in Jerusalem to meet. Does this man sound familiar? Does Joseph the Levite sound familiar to you? Well, perhaps you know him better by his nickname, Barnabas, which means the son of encouragement. And I'd often thought about that. If the, the, the apostles looked at this man and said, buddy, you're the encourager. I want to kind of know who he is. Why did they think that this individual was such an encouragement? And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at some snapshots in the book of Acts to see why Joseph, the Levite, who was named the encourager or Barnabas, was such a very, very special person to the early church. Let's have a word of prayer as we begin this morning. Our Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the sunshine. Thank you for the good weather. But Father, thank you for each and every one that's come out this morning to gather in this place to worship you, to lift up the name of Jesus Christ and all that he has done for us. Father, thank you for sending your only begotten Son Not to just be born as a baby in a, in a manger, but to grow up and live a sinless life. And to die on a cruel criminal's cross for each and every one of us. A death that we deserved. But Jesus took our place upon that cross of Calvary. And took all of our sins upon himself. And was judged for those sins. And when he was finished, he said, it is finished. And bowed his head and died. But he didn't stay in that grave. After three days, he rose again. And he's in your presence now, Father. And we await the day that Jesus will come and take us to be with you forever. But until that time, God, may we be faithful in all that you've called us to do. To share our faith with others. To live a life, to live an example of Jesus before men and women and boys and girls so that we can share with them the hope that is within us about how they can know for sure their sins can be forgiven and they can have a home in heaven for all eternity. And Father, if there's one here today who does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, 
I pray that before they leave today, they'll reach out to one of us and we can show them from the Bible how they can be saved. God, thank you again for this time. Thank you for my brothers and sisters, and I pray that you'll bless us as we continue to look through your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first thing that we'll see as we look at Barnabas, the encourager, the first snapshot, if you will, is that an, an encourager sacrifices for others. One who would be an encourager is one who sacrifices for others. Open your Bibles, please, to the book of Acts. And we'll start today in Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4 and verses 32 through 37. Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 37. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. And neither said any of them that ought have things of their own which they possessed... But they had all things in common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was any of them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the prices of these things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made as any man according as he had need. And Joseph, who was by the apostles surnamed Barnabas, which is being translated the son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. These first verses that we're going to be looking at are almost identical with the verses found over in Acts chapter 2, in verses 43 and 44, which says, And great fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and they had all things in common. This particular time in Christianity was a very, very scary time for Christians. They were persecuted. They really had no social status in the Roman Empire. They were pretty much the lowest of the low. And in order to get along and in order to care for one another in their community, they would often gather together to share, to care for one another, and to provide funds or whatever might be needed for their brothers and sisters in Christ. And we often we see that here today, even in our own church time. We see people that are in need. We see people that may have had health problems and bring food to them, care for them. Pray for them. We see others in hospitals and we go and visit them. It's just the way that we are as believers. We care for one another. We look out for each other. And that's what was going on here in the early church. And the, Luke characterizes the community of believers by four things. Number one, their unity in mind and heart. In verse 32. Their sharing of their possessions in verse third, the latter part of verse 32. The power and witness of the apostles in verse 33. And the grace of God which rested upon them all. The major focus was their unity and their fellowship in the spirit. And this served as the, this serving shared as the basis of what they had to do as Christians. They shared their possessions so that there was no one needy among them. And verses 34 and 35 explain how this was done. Those that had lands or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds and lay them at the apostles' feet. And then the apostles would distribute those funds as people of that community had need. And Luke provided two examples, two very distinct examples of Christian sharing. One followed by Barnabas, which was to be followed, and one followed by another couple whose name was Ananias and Sapphira. You remember them? How'd their life turn out? Not so good. We're not really going to spend a lot of time looking at Ananias and Sapphira today. We're going to spend our time looking at the positive one of what Barnabas did. 
And here Luke introduces us again to Joseph, the Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, the son of encouragement. He sold some land and brought this money and he laid it at the apostles' feet. And we're not told where this field was located, whether it was in Judea or whether it was in Cyprus, but Barnabas took something of very great value to himself and simply gave it away. Just said, here, take it and use it to support the believers in Jerusalem. And this was at least one of the acts that earned Barnabas his nickname. It puts actions to your words. And it's the foundation of what it means to be a Christian. An encourager is one who helps another, even when it comes at great personal cost. Let me say that again. An encourager is one who helps another, even when it comes at great personal cost. The United States Congress designated March 25th, later on this month of every year, as the National Medal of Honor Day. And if you're a fan of Texas A&M, anybody here? Probably many of us. There are eight Aggies who have been awarded the Medal of Honor. Clarence Sasser, Texas A&M class of 1973, was the last, the eighth Aggie, to be awarded the Medal of Honor. Sasser briefly attended the University of Houston as a chemistry major, but was forced to drop out due to lack of funds. During the Vietnam War, what happened if you weren't in school, guys? You got drafted, and that's what happened to Sasser. He served as a combat medic during the Vietnam War, and on January 10, 1968, Sasser's company was making an air assault when suddenly it came under heavy fire from a well-fortified position on three sides of the landing zone. And during the first few minutes, over 30 casualties were sustained. And without hesitation, Special Assassin ran across an open rice paddy through a hail of fire to assist the wounded. After helping one man to safe safety, Sasser was painfully wounded in his left shoulder by fragments of an exploding rocket. Refusing medical attention, he ran through a barrage of rocket and automatic weapons fire to aid the casualties of the initial attack. And after giving them urgently needed treatment, he continued to search for the wounded. Despite two additional wounds immobilizing his legs, he dragged himself through the mud to another soldier a hundred meters away. Although in agonizing pain and faint from loss of blood, Sasser reached the man, treated him, and proceeded on to encourage another group of soldiers to crawl 200 meters to relative safety. There he attended to their wound for five hours until they were eventually evacuated. On that day in 1968, Clarence Sasser sacrificed his own well-being for that of his fellow soldiers. That's a pretty special guy. Can you think of another man who sacrificed everything for us? Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said in John 15, 13, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for his friends. An encourager is one who sacrifices for others. The next mark of an encourager is seen in the, in the life of Barnabas in that an encourager seeks the best in others. An encourager seeks the best in others. In Acts chapter 9, we meet up with Barnabas once again. A man named Saul had experienced a radical conversion. This man who had once persecuted and executed Christians had now become a Christian himself. But he was having a little trouble gaining acceptance from his former en enemies. Can you, can you doubt him? In Acts chapter 9, verses 26 and 27, Acts chapter 9, verses 26 
and 27, we read, And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he tried to join himself with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But who shows up? Barnabas. Here he is again. And Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and how he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly in Damascus in the name of Jesus. So once again, when Saul came to Jerusalem, he was trying to be friends with this community of believers. He's like, hey, you guys have said that we're all like one, right? And they're like, yeah, but just a little while ago, you were trying to kill us. Uh, we're not so sure about you. But Barnabas shows up on the scene and does what Barnabas does. He took hold of him and brought him to the apostles. And he told them how Saul, on the journey to Damascus, had seen Jesus. And that Jesus had spoken to him. And how at Damascus, Saul had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. Saul, the former Christian killer, was being shunned by the church. But Barnabas, the encourager, takes him by the hand and brings him to the leaders and says, let me tell you about the change in my brother Saul. An encourager sees the good in us that others can't. They encourage us by saying, I believe in you. Does anybody follow baseball here? Oh, a few of you do. You ever heard of Jackie Robinson? Jackie Robinson was the first African-American to play baseball in the major leagues. And breaking baseball's color barrier, he faced hostile crowds in every stadium. And while playing one day in his home stadium of Ebbets Field in Brooklyn, oh my goodness, he made an error. You don't want to watch me play baseball because I do that a lot. And the fans began to jeer him. And he stood at second base, humiliated, while the crowd booed. And then, without saying a word, Pee Wee Reese, the shortstop, went over and stood next to Jackie. And he put his arm around him, and together they just looked up at the crowd. And the fans grew quiet. Robinson later said that that arm around his shoulder saved his career. Pee Wee Reese was an encourager that day. He stood up and said, I believe in this man. So if we're going to be an encouragement to others, we need to look for the best in others and stand with them when the rest of the world jeers. An encourager sees the best in others. In the next episode of Barnabas' life, we see that an encourager is a spiritual influence on others. An encourager is a spiritual influence on others. We're going to move on to Acts chapter 11 now, just a couple pages over in your Bible. News has come to the church leaders in Jerusalem that revival has broken out in Antioch. The Gentiles are now becoming believers. Can you believe it? And the apostles in Jerusalem knew just the guy they needed to send down to Antioch to encourage these new believers. Acts chapter 11, verses 22 through 24 says, And the tidings of these things came to the ears of the church that was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth who? Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch, who, when he had came and seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave together unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and many people were added to the Lord. This is a very, very special time in the church when we see 
believers not only coming from a Jewish background, but now they're becoming Christians from a Gentile background. God is the Savior of all. And we're starting to see the very beginnings of this here. Barnabas encouraged others. He encouraged new believers in their faith. He was a strong spiritual example. And this is an important aspect of encouragement that's often overlooked. The most important part of us as human beings truly is not our bodies. Although, Pastor Max, we spend a lot of time taking care of our bodies, don't we? We really do. But I can guarantee you that unless the Lord comes back, what's going to happen to each and every one of our bodies? They will die. They will die. Each of us will, unless the Lord intervenes. So it's not the physical aspect of our bodies that's truly the most important, although God does want us to take care of our temples. He wants us to take care of our spirits, our spiritual part. To make sure what we put into our minds, what we put into our hearts, what we put in to make us who we are is the right thing. Not to let the world become part of us, but use this book to filter everything that we allow into our lives, into our minds. And Barnabas was one of those individuals that wanted to encourage people to do what was right to take care of their spirit. An encourager who helps physically but doesn't help spiritually, who doesn't share the good news of Jesus Christ, who isn't encouraging others to follow the Lord, really isn't much of an encourager at all. You can find a lot of self-help books out there. You can find a lot of feel-good TV shows every morning, I guarantee you, on shows. But if you really want somebody to help you, you hang around with some Christian people. They will encourage you. An encourager brings the spiritual aspect into daily life. And when a friend shares a struggle they're facing, what stops us from offering a prayer right then and there? I've done that many times. You might be here at prayer meeting. You might be standing out in the parking lot. And somebody comes up to you and says, would you pray for me? My person is having a problem. I'm having a problem. And you say, oh, sure, I'll do that. And you get in your car and drive away. Why not pray with them right there? Or if somebody tells you something on the phone, I've done this many times too, they're talking about something that's really important in their life, and, and would you mind adding this to your prayer list? And I'm like, well, sure, I'll put it on my list, but could I pray for you right now? Do it. Be that encouragement. That has encouraged me so many times when somebody stops me and just prays for me. Do it yourself. Be like Barnabas. Be that encouragement. Be that spiritual influence on others. Because that's what encouragers do. One of the things that my mom was always like that too. Matter of fact, she still is like that. Mom's 87. <clears throat> and I, I love my mom. She was the one that helped me to come to know Jesus Christ. I remember sitting on the floor every evening before we'd go to bed, and mom would pull out this little white kid's Bible, and you open it up, and it has all the stories about Moses and about Noah and Adam and Eve and all those things, and we love to sit and listen to those stories. And when mom would get ready to close the Bible, we're like, oh, just one more, mom. Just one more story. Of course, we were just trying to get not go to bed. <clears throat> but we really love to hear those stories. And mom would pray with us every night. And mom led us to the Lord. There's eight kids in my family. And all eight of us came to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Because of a faithful mom. Because she was a spiritual influence on others. My mom also babysat. She would, would take in kids from the community as others would go off to work. And, and she knew they didn't have a lot of money. And she said, would, would a dollar an hour be enough? I'll feed them too. Yeah. 
That's my mom. And she cared for people. She started counting one day. She was writing on a piece of paper all the kids that had been through her house. After a hundred kids, seriously, she stopped counting. She said, I just can't remember all the rest of them. A hundred kids came through our house. And I guarantee you, every one of them went with her to Bible school. Would heard those Bible stories out of that little white Bible. Yeah, that's my mom. An encourager is a spiritual influence on others. Fourthly, an encourager works for the success of others. An encourager works for the success of others. Right there in Acts chapter 11, look at verses 25 and 26. Then departed Barnabas for Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught many people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Saul had been out of the picture now for almost nine years. And Barnabas needed some help in leading that new church in Antioch. So he went to look for Saul. And he trained him to be a church leader. And at the end of that year, in Antioch, the pair was sent out by the church on their first missionary journey. And you can see this on through Acts chapter 13. It says, let's read this. Now there were in the church that was in Antioch certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian, which was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And verse 2 says, And they ministered to the Lord and fasted, and the Holy Spirit said, Separate unto me Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them, and they sent them out. They sent them out on their very first missionary journey. And often as we look at names in the scriptures, when we see a group of names, we typically find the one that's listed first is the one that's in charge. So if you look at this list of teachers that was in Antioch, Barnabas and Simeon and Menaean, who was the first one? Barnabas. Who was the last one? Saul. So he was kind of like the junior guy. He was one that they were bringing along. He was the associate pastor, the one that needed some help, that needed encouragement. But yet he was still one of their leaders. And when they were set out on the missionary trip, it says, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul. So who was intended to be the leader of that missionary journey? Barnabas was, that's right. But at some point along the way, as they're going on this missionary journey, look in verse 9. This is a kind of an important verse if you've never seen this one before. It says, Saul, who was also called Paul... Filled with the Holy Ghost. Here's that name change. Remember back earlier in the Gospels? Simon the fisher man. Did he get another name? What do they call Simon the fisherman? Peter. The rock. That's what that meant. Remember that? Here's a change too. From Saul, who was the former murderer, if you will, now becomes Paul. And all throughout the rest of the scriptures, you're going to see him referred to as Paul. Now, move on down in your, in your passage just to a little bit in 1313. And now it says, as they're moving through this missionary journey, now, when Paul and his company, loose from Paphos, they went to Perga in Pamphylia. Who's in charge of the program now? Paul. I thought Barnabas was in charge. Ah. He was, but see, he's been teaching Barnabas, or Barnabas has been teaching Paul all along, this is how you lead this group. This is how you do ministry, Paul. This is how you lead, Paul. This is how you're a spiritual influence on others, Paul. Do it. And he turns it over to him. That's the key thing about Christians, especially ones who are encouragers. They work for the success of others, not for themselves. They don't look for the glory to be brought back to themselves. They want to see others do wonderful things. And he does that with, with Paul. 
Barnabas trains Saul so well that he surpasses him in leadership. And Barnabas cheers him on. As encouragers, we should be overjoyed when our help and support play a part in the success of others. Former President Ronald Reagan once said, there's no limit to what we can accomplish if we don't care who gets the credit. Let me say that again. There's no limit to what we can accomplish if we don't care who gets the credit. Work for the success of others. And Barnabas also encouraged another person, a young man whose name was John Mark. This is John whose surname was Mark. Acts 12, 12 introduces us to John. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark. And there many were gathered together praying. And according to Colossians 4.10, uh, John Mark was either a cousin or a nephew of Barnabas. He was a family member. And he went back with them to Antioch to assist them in the ministry. Acts 12.25 says that Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem. And when they had fulfilled their ministry, they took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Here's another little guy that Barnabas wants to bring along in the ministry to teach him how to do what's going on to teach him how to serve, to teach him how to preach. Just a young man. And Barnabas also wanted to take, them, take him along as their helper, their minister on that first missionary journey. Um, it says in Acts chapter 13, verse 5, And when they were in Salmas, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John as their helper. But for some reason... John left them and returned to Jerusalem. It says in Acts chapter 13, verse 13, And when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John departed from them and went back to Jerusalem. He did not finish what he had started. He quit. We have to remember that not everyone will succeed. But we should work towards that end. And Barnabas never gave up on anybody. Remember that. <laughs> That's just what the encouragers do. They don't quit on people. They keep saying, I see something in you. I see something in you, and I'm not going to give up on you. Which brings us to our final point this morning. An encourager is slow to judge others. An encourager is slow to judge others. They came back from the missionary journey. They're all kind of sitting around talking about things and some time has gone by. Acts chapter 15, verse 35. Acts chapter 15, verse 35 Paul and also Barnabas continued at Antioch. Again, who's in charge? Paul is. Teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, Hey, let's go again and visit our brothers in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. That's a good thing, right? Let's go check them out. All these churches that we got started, I wonder how they're doing. Barnabas, let's go. Let's get that old Ford pickup truck and we're going to just drive off and see what's going on out there. Oh, by the way, John Mark's coming with us. And Barnabas determined to take with him John, whose surname was Mark. That little guy that quit. Paul wasn't very happy about that. It says in verse 38 that Paul thought it not good to take them with him who had departed from them in Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And basically what we're going to see right here is one of the first church splits. It says that the contention was so sharp between Paul and Barnabas that they departed asunder one from another. Barnabas took Mark and sailed into Cyprus and Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren into the grace of God. This wasn't some little conversation. Oh, Barnabas, 
I'm not very excited about your decision. Oh, Paul, thank you for considering this. Let's, let's talk some more. No! Barnabas says, this guy's a good guy. John Mark, we're going to take him with us because I see good things in this young man. Paul's like, dude, he's a quitter. Why would we want to put him in a place again where he's going to quit again? Just let him go. Barnabas wouldn't let go of that. He's like, no, he has potential. And I believe in him. And Barnabas kept on going and Paul kept on going. My thing is, do we see any prayer mentioned here? Do we see any like good conversation happening here? I don't want to say these guys got in the flesh, but yeah. It was enough to tear their ministry apart. And Barnabas took Mark and he went back to home. He went to Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and brought him into the ministry. Can God even use our messes? <laughs> he does. He, used our me he even used their messes. Because number one, John Mark was brought back into the ministry. The quitter was now our participant. And Barnabas was going to keep teaching him. And yet on Paul's side, he brought another man into the ministry of Silas, who was now also going with him and learning from Paul. Instead of having one missionary journey, we now have two missionary journeys. And people are being taught to serve the Lord. Barnabas, again, sees potential in someone despite their past failure. And rather than labeling him as a quitter, Barnabas gives him a second chance. And anybody who has ever read the Gospel of Mark, John Mark, is very, very glad that Barnabas was that kind of an encourager. Isn't that cool? This quitter that couldn't go with him in the ministry because he was encouraged once again, God used that individual to write a gospel, the good news about his son. He had potential, and Barnabas saw that. As a matter of fact, Paul himself later decides that Barnabas was right about Mark. Shortly before his death, in the second letter to Timothy, Paul wrote, Take Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me in the ministry, it says in 2 Timothy 4.11. While the Bible doesn't specifically mention how Barnabas died, he was reportedly martyred for his faith like many of the other of the apostles. He was either stoned or burned to death in his homeland of Cyprus. But what an awesome individual we see in the person of Barnabas. Was Barnabas perfect? By all means, no. He had his mistakes, he had his sins just like we do. But yet he had a quality of encouragement that just makes me want to learn about this guy more and more. To be that encourager that Barnabas is. To look for others that are around me and look for the best in them. To seek for their success and to help them to grow in the Lord. Maybe someone did that for you. That brought you along in your life and your spiritual walk. Maybe you're doing that right now with somebody else. That's what we call discipleship, where we're taking a new believer and we're bringing them along in the Lord, encouraging, encouraging them in the way. We all need to be encouragers, just like Barnabas. And maybe you've never been encouraged to accept Jesus as your Savior, and I'd like to do that for you today. That even during our invitation time, Again, we can show you how you can know for sure your sins can be forgiven and you can have a home in heaven for all eternity. And for the rest of us, be a Barnabas. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you so much for a wonderful servant of yours called Barnabas. And Father, we know that he was not perfect. We know that he was not one without sin because there's only one that way and that's Jesus Christ but father help us to be faithful to follow the example of Barnabas 
to look for opportunities to encourage others. God, thank you for my brothers and sisters, and I ask that you would just help them in their daily walk to be looking for others that need help, that need that little pat on the back, that little calming voice, Lord, just to get them through that moment. Please help us. Father, thank you for all that you do for us. Bless our invitation now, I pray, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.